Amen. I want to bring a message this morning. When God shuts the door. You look at a picture there, you see a door that is open. That's the ark of Noah. When God shuts the door. And I believe that when we get into this message, it's going to help us to understand and to know the time in which we're living in. Of course, we all say we do, but sometimes we really don't. I want us to turn for a moment to Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from verse um, 11. Genesis chapter 6 this morning. And I'll be kind of moving around a little bit. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for your anointing. I pray for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide my words. Father, I pray, God, that it will touch the hearts of your people that not only are here in this assembly, but also that are listening on Facebook. Father, I pray that this message will go Viral, Lord, and people will share this message all over because our time is running out. Our time is short. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I found it very interesting, this scripture, that the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. You remember the words of Jesus in Matthew and in also in Luke when he said that the coming of the Son of Man will be as it was in the days of Noah. And so I started to research, I started to read these things about what was taking place in society, not so much in, in, the, in the religious sense, but in society. And as I was reading this and I was studying this, I came across a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word for violence. And I found it very amazing that the word in Hebrew for violence is Hamas. Hamas is an Arabian word, but in the Hebrew, it means violence. And I, I looked it up, and, and the word Hamas means violence, wrong, cruelty, and injustice. And doesn't that describe Hamas? The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with Hamas. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh, or life, has come before me, for the earth is filled with Hamas. As you know, Hamas is an, is an organization that is formed against Israel and against the people of God. And I believe that this scripture is speaking to us today that it doesn't seem coincidental, but it seems like God is telling us that Hamas, the violence, the cruelty, the injustice of this organization is going to come against God's people. For the end of all things is at hand. Then God said to Noah, because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with, say with, the earth. I want you to understand that these are not just stories. They're not just nice fairy tales in the Bible. These are words of truth that are going to happen to this earth. We are living in a cataclysmic time, an event. A paradigm shift is taking place. I don't know if you sense it. But in the atmosphere, there's a paradigm shift taking place where things are getting worse and worse and worse and worse. We're seeing more fires, more floods, more earthquakes. I counted over 100 earthquakes in one day around the world. This was just uh, this past week. There were over 100 earthquakes in the earth, some of them 2.9, 3.9, some 4.1, some 5.1, some 6.2, and of course, the great earthquake we just heard of in, in uh, Mexico of 8.2, some say even 
Jesus said that before he comes, there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. These are all not earthquakes happening in the same place. They're happening even in America. But sometimes the seismologists won't report it because it seems to be under 4.1 or 4.2. So they don't report those to the public. But they have them on file. If you go online, you can go to the seismic graphs and it will tell you everything about all of the earthquakes that take place. I have one on my phone on my radar weather supply for the, for the earthquakes. And I counted just on that 13 the other day. And so here we know that God is doing something uh, here on the earth, and he's allowing this to happen. Now some people say, well, what about the hurricanes and the tornadoes and everything? Is that God or is that just, is that just a, a natural phenomenon? Is that just a, a weather pattern? Is that just something that happens? Well, in the book of Nahum, if you know where Nahum is, it's in the Old Testament, chapter 1, the Word of God says that God has His way in the whirlwind. And sometimes God allows the whirlwind, amen, to shake us up, to wake us up. In Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, you can write these down and look them up after. It says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now, very interesting. Noah was a preacher. He was a man of righteousness, and he was preaching, and he was telling people about the the coming doom that was about to, that they're about to face because of the, their wickedness. Another place says that also as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and building and all these things. And that's exactly what's happening in our world today. People are eating and drinking and they're going on like life is just going to continue on forever and nothing's going to happen. But I want you to understand that Noah was a type of God's shofahan that he was blowing across the world. He was blowing a warning sign to them and telling them that there was going to be a flood, a worldwide flood. Some people say, well, I don't believe it could be a worldwide flood. Well, just think the rain that happened three days in Houston. And look at all the water was halfway up the buildings already, just on three days. Imagine 40 days and 40 nights of torrential rain. And then the ocean's overflowing and the waters and the levees and all the dams breaking and all that. So he was warning the people that God's judgment was about to be poured out upon the earth. And that this was going to be something that was going to cost them their lives. But what was their attitude? What was their attitude? They went right on with like everyday living. They went right on doing the things that they did. They bought, they sold, they, they built it, they drank, they married, they gave in marriage. They did all of the things that our society today is doing right now. Right now. And they lived that way until Noah entered the ark. It went right up until that time. Now here's the interesting part of that. As he was building this ark, I want you to see the side of society and what was happening in their emotions and in the way that they were thinking. First of all, they were mocking him. They were ridiculing him. Think about it. A worldwide flood, they've never heard of that before. That has never happened on the earth before. That's impossible, cannot happen. A worldwide flood? especially in the dry re region where they were? That's impossible. That's never going to happen. The, the weather cannot produce that, cannot happen that. See, they were looking toward the natural phenomena of not being able to do that, but they weren't looking at the supernatural phenomena that can cause that. And so their attitude was, we're going to live as we want, do as we want, say what we want to do, continue living in the homosexual, lesbian uh, lifestyles, because it says, as it was in the days of Sodom and Lot, so will it should be in the coming of the day of the Son of Man. 
So we see all of these signs, all of these things that are taking place, and yet how many people are ignoring the signs? How many people are, are just got into this uh, tolerant spirit and just settled and said, well, that's the way things are, and we just have to go along with what's happening today? But I want to warn those who are watching and those who are listening this morning. Genesis 7.16 is about to take place on the earth. The Bible says when the people that were with, Mo, with, uh, with Noah and, and heeded to his message, and they went in, male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, it says, and the Lord, what? Shut him in. When God closes the door, when God shuts the door, there are no second chances. When God shuts this door upon humanity, when Jesus comes back, the rapture. So many churches today are not preaching about the rapture, don't believe the rapture anymore. They say, well, it doesn't matter what I believe, I'm going to go anyway. No, you won't. They that endure to the end, they that continue to the end, if you continue in the faith, steadfast, unmovable, the scripture says. It's not about living complacent. It's like the ten virgins. Well, some went for oil and some didn't. When the Lord, the bridegroom came, those that had oil went and those that didn't, didn't go. They were all virgins. Why didn't they all go? The Lord shut them in. I want you to know that to be a Christian today, you'll be ridiculed, you'll be mocked, you'll be laughed at. Some of you may even be physically abused. Some of you, they're going to throw into jail. Jesus said these things were going to happen. He said, men will persecute you for my name's sake. I heard somewhere that there was going to be an anti-conversion law here in, the, in America. What's going to happen? Well, you know why I would say, a lot of the churches isn't doing evangelism today anyway. They're so concerned about their conferences and their, their programs. You've got more people coming to church that are not saved than us that are saved. And they clap and they know all the lingo. They know how to say the right words. They know how to say the name of Jesus. They have all of those things right. But are they living right for God? Are they living holy lives? Are they living right for God? That's the most important thing. It's not what you confess. It's not what you believe. It's who you are. I believe that God raises up people to give warning signs, to give danger signs, if you will, to let the world know about danger. How many of you ever watched Lost in Space? Some of you remember? Remember the robot? Remember that robot? I, got, I think he's got a picture up there somewhere. There he is. Remember, he was a good friend of Will Robinson, you know, and he used to be a young boy. And, and any time there was danger, he would, his arms would shake and he'd, he'd go back and forth like this and he would go, danger, danger, danger. And if they heeded to the danger, they were safe. But if they didn't, they were captured. And you know the whole story, something went wrong and they'd have to be rescued. Can I tell you, there are voices today that are out there crying danger, 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 and no one is listening. No one's listening. Why? Because society has been so torn down. But I want to say this, and I want to say this in the most loving, caring way that I can. The reason why society has been torn down 
is because the church has been contaminated with society. The church has become so worldly. The church has become so ungodly that the sinner looks at the church and says, why should I change? The church has tried to adapt itself and form itself according to the world. Let me tell you, I came out of the nightclub business. And I see some of the churches today removing the cross, removing any pulpit, putting a table, sitting down with coffee in the sanctuary, eating sandwiches and coffee and donuts in the sanctuary. Painting the altar all black, having all the lights and the fog and all of the, the nightclub scenery in the churches, breaking off the light sticks in the worship service and waving them back and forth and balls flying all over the place. They call that worship. Last week I preached that message make us a God that we can worship. In the Bible, we're Moses went up to the mountain. You, you know the story. You, you saw the message. Came back and the people were living in rivalry, rivalry. They were having orgies and they built a golden calf to worship Jehovah God through the calf. God destroyed them all. They were playing. They were singing. They were dancing in the name of Jehovah. And here God's warning the people of, his, of this time He's telling them, look, I'm going to bring destruction on these people because they're filled with Hamas. They're filled with violence. If you saw the little uh, post that I put up on the stand as you walk in, there's one there for not eat, no eats or drinks in the sanctuary, but there's another one there. The police are dropping them off everywhere saying that there's a, a, a rash of violence in, in the area here of people breaking into cars and stealing things. Make sure you lock your car. Make sure your valuables are in the trunk or somewhere else. It's getting worse and worse. It's not going to get better. Don't believe the lying preachers that are telling you that we're going to win the world to Jesus and we're going to present the kingdom over to God and we're going to send it up and then Jesus will come. That's kingdom theology. It's not going to happen. My Bible says Jesus said that things shall wax worse and worse. He said, they're going to kill you. They're going to throw you into prison. The end times are upon us, my friend. And we better make sure that we're ready. Now, 1 Peter 3.20 says, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited. Put that up for me, please. 1 Peter 3.20. which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. In other words, God was waiting for his people to repent. God doesn't wish that any would perish, but all would come to everlasting life. That's God's, heart, that's God's desire. But God will not force his way upon any person that has a free will that he's given him to choose him freely. You must choose whether you will receive, whether you'll believe, and whether you will walk out the life that he has given you. He says, while the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, how many? Eight souls were saved by water. There was over three million people back then. So what this is telling us is that the majority of people in the world will not believe. The majority of people will not come. But there's going to be a few. And I love this uh, scripture because it says eight souls. Eight is the number of new beginnings. If you add up the number of the word Jesus, it comes to 888. The time of new beginnings. God is saying, I'm giving you a way, a way of escape from my wrath that is being poured out upon the earth very soon. And will you take that opportunity before it's too late? 
Can I get a good amen? What is one of the things, I'm going to give you three things of what the door represents. The shut door indicates the failure of choice. The failure of choice. In other words, the shut door indicates the failure of choice because A, it no longer, no longer can one choose. In other words, once the door is shut, once the door is shut, cannot choose after that. Once God shuts the door on the Gentile church, listen to me. He said there is a time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When that time of the Gentiles be fulfilled, when that last Gentile comes in, that God knows who it will be, then God is going to begin dealing with Israel. And that's when we're going to see the ten year that's when we're going to see the seven year tribulation time, known as the time of Jacob's trouble where God is going to pour out his wrath, when that's the time when Israel will make a covenant with the Antichrist, the Antichrist will come and say, peace, peace, and when sudden peace comes, it says, then they shall be destroyed. The seven-year tribulation period is going to happen. I don't care whether people believe it's going to happen or not. It's going to happen according to the word of God. And that seven-year tribulation, before that tribulation begins, the church is going to be taken up for you. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. That's what the word says. A, you can no longer choose. The Bible says, and the Lord shut him in. You now have the freedom of choice. And you are either choosing heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Okay, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, judgment. There's no other place you go to, so I don't care how many candles you light, I don't care how many grapes you eat. People eat grapes. That was supposed to be a joke, but I didn't go over. You are not going to be saved out of that final decision you make. You have freedom to choose. Okay, so let's see, make sure you Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says this. God said, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. In other words, today is your day. Whether you're listening to, to me through Facebook. Not tomorrow, not the day after, today is the day that the earth is called into a account. He says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. God is given the choice. But it's today, it's not tomorrow. Suppose the door closes tomorrow. Suppose the rapture comes tonight then you're left on the earth and there's no way that door of the rapture for you to be taken out of here is going to take place. You're going to have to go through the tribulation period. You're going to have to go through the time of the Antichrist. You're going to have to go through whether taking that mark on your hand or your forehead. And if you don't, you won't be able to buy or sell. That means you won't be able to get food. You won't be able to pay your bills. You'll be out on the street. You'll have to scrounge for food. And nothing you say or do or prayer is going to help you to escape that. It's your choice. People say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. God's the only way. we got preachers on TV. Suppose that born-again Christians telling us that Jesus is not the only way. But Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So I, people that are religious, listen to me. These two to three million or more people that lived during the time of Noah had religion. They worshipped something. See, 
people's philosophy today is, well, all the roads lead back to God. Well, if that's true, how come they didn't make it on the ark? How come they perished? They were worshipers. They had gods. They worshiped God who they thought was the right God. But they perished. He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. That's not a lack of knowledge educational in an education system. That's a lack of knowledge of who he is and what he said. Romans 6.23 says this. You don't have to look it up. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It doesn't come any other way but through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I'm sure that if these people in Noah's day could, when they started to see what was happening, before that door closed, they would have changed their minds and repented and entered also. I wonder how many people one day will wish that they had made the choice to listen to Noah. To listen to what he was saying. Here he was, he was building this ark. How foolish a person to build a boat where there's no surrounding water. Especially that huge. Think about it. I could see if he was building a boat close by the, by the water and the shore, you know. But no, he was inland. And here he's building this 140, 150 foot long, I, don't, I forget how, how long it was. Ship. First cruise ship. On dry land. They must have mocked him and laughed at him and said, you're crazy, you're insane. What are you doing? How is water going to reach you to float that boat? I mean, all of the scientific reason and all of the natural reasoning of man was trying to fit into a box to say, this cannot happen. But how many know with God all things are possible? The door or the shut door indicates the failure of choice because B, no longer can one confess. There's no time to confess. There is no one to hear the confession. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't God hear all the time? No. In the book of Isaiah, the word of God says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities and your sins have hid, his, hid, hid God from you that he will not hear. So it's not a point that God doesn't intervene. It's that you made the choice. You made the choice of not listening. And God is not obligated to tell you a second time. Hello? You understand there are people that have heard the gospel one time and they've died after that. One time. And here in society in America, we hear it over and over and over and over. Leonard Ravenhill, great prophet of God. If you've never heard of him, get one of his books. Sodom had no Bible. Sodom didn't have a Bible, but they had a preacher. And if God judged Sodom, and America has thousands if not millions of Bibles printed every single year on their shelves, in their bookcases, beside their bed, in the hotel rooms, they have programs on television and radio that are proclaiming the gospel 24-7. Well, some of them are. Some of them are promoting sowing your seed. What is going to be the end for America that has killed over 60 million babies through abortion? And their blood is crying out for vengeance. Come on, somebody. And we think America's going to get away with it because we give away food and we help people and we're good and we're nice. Your good works cannot save you. 
For it is by faith that you are saved through, it is by grace you are saved through faith, and not of your works, lest any man should boast. Isn't that good for America too? We can have a heart of compassion and reach out and help our neighbor, you know, through these difficult times. Yes, that's a wonderful thing. But when God is trying to get our attention and we continually rise up in pride saying, we will rebuild and we'll be better than before without falling on our knees and saying, God, help us. Show us where we've wronged you. Show us, use this time as I use that prayer request for Florida, that souls will be saved through this disaster. And the Lord shut the door. No longer can we confess. There's no one to hear the confession. We think that we have an open invitation to go to God anytime we want, any way we want. No, you, you don't. Read your Bible. You ever read the story about the blind man and he was healed and he went before the Pharisees and the religious bunch and the, in that discussion they said that well, we know that God spoke to us through Moses but as to this man we don't know anything. And then the man said for we know that God does not hear sinners. I believe the only prayer that God hears from an unregenerated person is the prayer of salvation. A cry for help be saved. But today we're in a society we live in, you can have an unbeliever living an ungodly life and they'll ask you to pray for them. How can I pray God's favor on someone who's rebellious, doesn't want Jesus, doesn't want God in their life, but only in a time of trouble will call on Him? How can we pray for them? I first asked them this question. Before I pray for that, do you want God in your life? Do you want Jesus to come in, into your life and save you? You need to repent of your sins. Are you willing to repent of your sins and turn from your wicked ways and serve God the rest of your life? Oh, no, I don't want that. I just want you to pray for me. You know what I tell them? I'm sorry. My prayers will do nothing for you. See, that's the reality. But this tolerating all-inclusiveness that is happening in our world society today is, oh, everyone's, say, you know, God has, we have access to God. All of us have access to God. No, you don't. You only have access to God through Jesus Christ. And we think that because we're living in sin and we're doing our own thing and going our own way, that God is obligated to listen to us? No, he's not. I read you the scripture in Isaiah. He will not hear you. And sometimes that's why people ask us to pray because they feel like God's not listening to them. And I say, if they say that to me, well, I feel like God's not will listen to you because you know I've seen God answer prayers for you, but He doesn't listen to me. I say that's because you're you got to get right with God. You got to confess your sins to God. No, I don't want to do that. I just want to get blessed. Sorry, can't pray for you. I've been I've been ridiculed for that. I'm sorry. I will not pray for somebody to do something illegal. Someone asked me one time to pray for them that they could get away with something illegal. I'm serious. And that person ended up leaving the church. They were Christians, supposedly. Can you imagine suppose a Christian coming to the pastor and asking him to pray for something to be done illegally so they can get away with it? And I said, no not going to do that. Do you think I was a mean pastor? Or do you think I was trying to tell him the truth of, hey, let's do things right. Let's get things done right. God loves righteousness. Let's do it right. Let's not do it wrong. Today the church is just accepting everything and anything and anyone into the church. And there's more people that are unsaved in churches today than there are saved. 
Because all they're concerned about is the, the quantity of people in the church and not the quality. They're only concerned about the tithes and the offerings and how much they can get done and the bigger buildings that they can build. That's not where it's at. That's not where it's at. If you get that, praise God. But don't let that be your focus. The focus is souls. The, the focus is making sure people are right with God, preaching the Word of God without compromise. The shut door indicates, number two, the fulfillment of grace. And while they were to buy, the groom came. And those that were ready went in with him to the wedding, and, and the door was shut, the Bible says. God's grace is given only for a time. Someone was talking with me the other day and we were, had a good discussion about grace. And he said a lot of people think that God's grace is just something that's hanging there, you know, waiting. And he said, no, when we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. He said, that grace that's being talked about in that song, that grace was Jesus dying on the cross. That grace is available at the cross. You can't get that grace apart from the cross. Hello? Titus 2, verse 11 to 14. I won't be too much longer. Titus 2, verse 11 to 14. Let me get a little drink. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Now, wait a minute. I thought, and let me just interject this one thing. There are a lot of people on TV, too, preaching what's called hyper grace. What's hyper grace, Pastor? Hyper grace is simply this. One of them is Joseph Prince. I'll, I'll mention his name is that grace covers all. And that you don't have to confess your sins anymore because grace covers all. That's what Joseph Prince teaches. Grace covers all, so you don't have to confess your sins anymore. Well, my Bible says confess your sins that you may be healed. Confess your false sins one to another that you may be healed. If any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father. How do we get right with God? Through, through confession of sin. So either Joseph Prince is right or the Bible's right. But look at the following he has. Look at the big, uh, big churches he has. That doesn't make a person right. Grace is not something like a Band-Aid. Grace isn't something that you just stick on you after you sin and say, okay, I, I'm say, I, I, God, I'm, I want grace, please forgive me. And then go right back out and do the same thing over again. And come back, okay, Put another band-aid of grace on me. That's not what grace does. Grace has a living way of doing something in us. And what is that? It's teaching us to what? Deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Why does it cause us to deny? See, that's a word that Christians don't like. Jesus said, if you will come after me, let a man take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. Deny yourself. We don't like that. Because we live in a society where you can have anything and everything that you want to. You're just going to go out and get it. You do the right things, say the right words, you can have whatever you speak. That's a lie. The true Christian, the true biblical Christianity is... Denying yourself. You cannot be his disciple without be denying yourself. He said, you cannot be my disciple. If you will not take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me, you're not worthy of me. You cannot follow Christ and be a Christian that is a follower of Christ. For you will be one of those in the camp that says, but Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do many wonderful miracles and many wonderful works in your name? And he'll say, 
Oh, sure, come on in. Come sup with us and have a good time. No. He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. Why? Because you weren't willing to deny yourself. But grace teaches us to deny ungodly, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, and that we should live what? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's the true meaning of grace. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I love Strong's definition of grace. That's why if you don't have a Strong's dictionary, get one. The Greek word for grace means this. The divine influence upon the heart with the reflection of that influence in your life. A divine influence in your heart in your inner man, and the influence of that being evident in your life. How is it evident in your life? It is through denying self. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. Oh, good works? Yes. Faith without works is dead. You can say you love Jesus. You can say you love God. You can say you love coming to church. You can say you love praise. You can say you love speaking in tongues. You can say you love all of those things. But how do we know that? through how you live. Grace is fulfilled because God's grace, listen to me now, can be exhausted. Grace is exhausted by unrepented hearts. Genesis 6.3 says this, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he indeed is flesh. God's spirit will not strive with man always. Some will be gone, going into everlasting damnation, some to everlasting life. The theology of universal salvation that the whole world is going to be saved is, is, is erroneous. If that's so, then why did Jesus say, fear those that can throw both body and soul into hell? There's a place for the devil and his angels, and there's a place for people to go with the devil and his angels as those who are rebellious in society like these two to three million people that didn't want to listen to Noah's message, didn't want to take heed to what Noah was wanting them. And I'm telling you today, there are preachers today that are wanting the church to get right with God and stop all of this uh, arguing and fighting and stop all of this prosperity garbage. That's the number one thing that Christians want today is prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. Sow your seed, sow your seed, sow your seed. Forget that. It's not about prosperity because when you die, none of your money is going with you. Your 401k is not going with you. Your Armani suits are not going with you. Your diamond rings and jewelry are not going with you. Because your soul is going somewhere. Your body's going in the ground, it's going to return to the dust. And so will the rings and the jewelry and everything else if someone doesn't break in and steal it from you. But where are you going to go? What are you going to do? God's grace can be exhausted. God's grace is exhausted by excess of sin. 
Genesis 6, 5 to 7 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every thought, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God looks down at society today and look at, we've grown worse than Noah's day. Think about it. In Noah's day, there was maybe two to three million people. Today, we have almost seven billion people. Look at the percentage of those who are true Christians. I'm not talking denominational Christian. There are those who claim to be Christians through their denomination. But they don't live for God. They don't care about God. They only care about their life and how rich they can get and how big a houses they can get and, and how uh, they can succeed in the world. They don't care about God. They go to God on Saturday for confession and Sunday for service. I've seen the hypocrisy in my own self that claim to be good, solid Christian men and women. And they were devoted Catholics. They would go to confession on Saturday, confess their sin, yet claiming to be good Catholics. And when I was playing in the nightclubs, I'd be playing and all of a sudden this one or two solid Christian Catholics came in with their girlfriends while their wives were sitting home. Hello? But in the eyes of the world, that's okay. In the eyes of the world, that's okay because they're still Christians. No, they're not. They're part of a denominational Christian religion, but they're not true of the true biblical born-again Christian because without being born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how many times you go to church, how many times you raise your hand, how many times you speak in tongues. I don't care about all that. All I know is that if you are not born again, you have not been transformed in, from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light, you are not a Christian, and you will not go to heaven. That's the truth that people don't want to hear. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that God sent his only begotten son so that he would die on the cross for you to receive the way of salvation. The choice is yours. But can I tell you, the door's shutting. More and more people are rejecting the gospel. Now we have our government telling us where we can go share the gospel. And if we share the gospel, and it's not right to them, and they don't want to hear it, they can arrest us for preaching the gospel. For telling people they need to be saved. They need to confess their sin. But yet when a national tragedy happens, we have the hypocrites in Washington standing on the Capitol steps saying to the public, please pray. To who? For what? Because you are in a crisis and all you, want, all you want to do is get out of your crisis? When 9-11 came, and I don't forget 9-11. I know some people do, but I don't. I know exactly where I was. I knew exactly what I was doing when 9-11 came. And I'll never forget that. When 9-11 happened, people in America began to panic. They saw the frailty of humanity. They saw the evilness of man. For the first time on our own soil, we were attacked. Men and women lost their lives simply by going on a traveling mission, either to California or wherever those planes were going. They had every intention of coming back, of making their destination, accomplishing what they wanted to, and coming back home. That was their whole set that day. But we know that they never did. They thought they would. But that day they didn't. And those planes crashed in there and people began to panic and they saw the turmoil and 3,000 
souls were lost that day. Including first responders, including police and firemen. They gave, they ran into those buildings to try to rescue people, and those buildings collapsed on top of them. Churches were filled. People went to church and began to pray, seek God, repent. And three months after, there was more people that left the church than went in the church. The secular humanistic philosophies of our colleges and universities are poisoning the mind of young people. And through their philosophy courses, are telling young people today there is no God. God is dead. So people are growing up in this school system. A school one time that, that used to acknowledge God. A school system one time that wouldn't even start the day without prayer. Now turn their back on God. And the reason why we're in the dilemma we're in with our young people today is because the church has grown cold. They allow the universities and the, and, the, and the colleges of today to form the, their, their little minds and their philosophies and ideologies and their doubts of their hearts, that they may have some doubts or fears, and, the, and that we never address those doubts, we never address those fears, we never tell them about what, what's right and what's wrong because we let them live their lives. I cannot believe this. I cannot believe this. Someone was telling me this, and I think I mentioned this before, that there's a, two professors in a college, and they have a little boy slash girl they told her, we're going to let him decide whether he wants to be a boy or a girl. Five years old. Give me a break. You're going to let a five-year-old decide whether he's going to be a boy or a girl? Where's the, fa where's the true father? That man's not a father. Where's the true mother? to raise that child that's only five years old that doesn't know right from wrong, goo goo from ga ga. But that's the kind of society we live in today. Live and let live. Be tolerant. But they're not tolerant of us. They want us to put up with them, but they won't put up with us. We want them to listen to what they say, but they won't listen to us. What about my rights? What about your rights? To be able to speak the name of Jesus. You may not want to agree with me, and that's fine, and we can walk away still friends. But that is not going to stop me from telling you what's going to happen. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a book of stories. This is going to happen. Romans 1.28. Some would say, well, that's the Old Testament. God won't do that today. Not so. Read Revelation. Read Revelation where he is going to open up the wrath, the scrolls of God's wrath upon the earth. Romans 1.28 says this, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, listen to me, God gave them up. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God says, okay, you want to continue in the way that you're going? I'm done. That's, the, that's my modern version of you. I'm done. God's grace can be exhausted. His mercy can be exhausted. I want to say this in closing. When God shuts the door, I don't care what kind of instruments you have, you will never pry that door open. Once that door closes, it's over. Once that door closes, it's over. We're living in a society today 
It was four or five fires on the West Coast, Oregon, Washington, California, Nevada, Oklahoma. Wildfires devouring hundreds and thousands of acres. And we got floods happening all over the place. We've got hurricanes. We've got tornadoes happening all over the place. We've got murder happening all over the place. Chicago. I think there's over 400 already murders. Think about this. In the city of Chicago, over 400 murders from January till now. Maybe more. I think it might be 600. Not counting people that were shot and survived. And, oh, by the way, for you uh, gun haters out there, they have the strictest gun laws in the United States. So guns are not the issue. The heart is wicked above all things. It's the heart. I want this church, our church, to begin to pray on a regular basis for the salvation of our loved ones. I want us to begin to pray to go out and witness for Christ, no matter where you are. Not, you're not only on the worship team, but as you go out through your daily life, as you touch people's lives, as you're, as you're standing beside someone's hospital bed, and God's Spirit's moving on you to pray for that person. Pray for them. Ask them if they want to receive Jesus. Go to your friends. Go to your neighbors. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them it's time. The wrath of God is about to be poured out even more. And I'm going to say this. The disasters that are coming upon this United States... And I believe God has given us Donald Trump as a rest period time to get right. He's going to bring some things and make them right, but he's not God. He's not the Savior. He's not going to, do, he's not going to save the United States. I'll tell you why. There's too many corrupt people in Washington. They would rather, they would rather see people suffer then pass a, a bill to help people unless they attach something to it. Well, we'll give you the $8 billion you need, Mr. Trump, if you give us a raise in the debt ceiling. In other words, let us put us further in debt. Why can't you just raise, just give the $8 billion without any conditions? Corrupt. Noah's time was corrupt. Our time is corrupt. Yes, there are some good people. But those good people are so few and far between. And there's such overpowering of evil that they feel helpless and they give in. You're going to see more disasters in America. I hate to say it, but it's going to happen because it has not brought America to its knees yet. So it's going to get worse and worse and worse. They're talking about Florida now losing electricity for could be up to a month. Think about living in, a, in your society, in your neighborhood without electricity for a month. What's going to happen if a bomb goes off, and that goes off in our atmosphere from that nut in North Korea? And it destroys that, uh, what is it called? The magnetic pulse. You won't have a cell phone. You won't be able to text. You'll be going through text withdrawals. You won't be able to use your phones, won't be able to use your microwaves, won't be able to use anything that's electric. Won't be able to watch TV, won't be able to run anything. Won't have cable TV. Won't have your games. It's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. 
Am I saying that to cause fear in you? No. I'm saying all these things because this is what the Bible says. Jesus said this. When you see these things, look up. For your redemption draws nigh. Look up. Your Redeemer, your Redeemer draws nigh. Look up. Jesus is coming. There's a song. Jesus is coming. People get ready. Jesus is coming. Do you believe me? Do you believe the word, I should say? Jesus is coming. And are you ready? Everything else that we're going through in, in this world is this, it's immaterial. It doesn't matter. When God shuts the door, it's too late. It'll be too late for your children. It'll be too, too late for your grandchildren. It'll be too late for your cousins, your aunties, your uncles, your grandmas, your grandpas, your mommy, your daddy. It'll be too late for brothers or sisters. It will be too late when God shuts that door. Think about it. When Noah's day, when they shut, God shut them in. Think about this. God shut them in. The waters began to arise. People started running toward the ship, Noah's ark. Think about this. Running to the ark, banging on the door. Let us in! Let us in! We believe! Let us in! We believe you, Noah! Let us in! Let us in! Let us in! We believe you! The door was shut. The door was shut. And they ground. Let us in! Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now is the day. I'll close with this little story. Jimmy and Susan. Jimmy and Susan. I broke my, I broke my things. Jimmy and Susan. They're six years old and seven years old. They're on the porch and they're playing. And they live down in the south. So I don't know if you've ever lived down in the south and you've been in a rainstorm down the south. It rains. Well, it started to rain, thunder, and lightning. And Johnny and Susan are on a porch playing. And all of a sudden, Johnny comes in and he slams the door and he locks it. Little Susie's out there. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. And, his, and the mom hears and says, Kids, what's going on? Johnny says, That's Susie. She's outside. She's banging on the door. He's, she says, Is it rainy? She says, Yes, it is, Mommy. It's storming and there's lightning and thunder. He said, well, let your sister in. He said, no. She said, I'm telling you, you let your, you let your sister in. He says, I can't. And she said, well, why can't you? He said, well, because we're playing Noah's Ark and she's a sinner. <laughs> For an hour, an hour that you think not, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. God, I ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, that you will, by the power of your Holy Spirit, use these words today to wake people up, for people to get ready, because you're coming soon. God, let all these disasters that are happening prick people's hearts to turn away from their selfish lives and turn back to you. Use it for your glory, Lord. Lord, it's not to condemn anybody, but it's to wake people up and show them how short life is and how unpredictable it can be. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would be with us and help us, Lord, to share your message of your Son with others and live a life that is pleasing to you.
but grace will teach us to live on, to, to, to deny ungodliness and to, 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 to deny worldly lusts and to live righteously, soberly in this present world. And we thank you, Lord. Be with, their, be with them this week, Father, I pray, Lord, when they're rising up, they're lying down, they're going in, they're coming out. And bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this morning.